Hello everyone, Billy from Gym City Welding. Just wanted to add this little video in the front. I realized I didn't re record an introduction, so here you go. Thank you for watching. Hey guys, got a question. Ever have a moment in your project where you're going along, everything's nice, fine, and then you do something that you really don't want to do and go, oh my God, I think I just ruined my project pretty much where I'm at right now. So cutting the belly, not sorry, not cutting the belly, cutting the front cross member lip off so I can reinforce the whole thing. Yeah, pretty much full panic mode right now. So take a break for a second. Ask the wife to make me a drink. Got me a drink. I'm starting to feel a little bit better, but I've hit that moment. Let me flip it around and I'll show you what I'm talking about. Yeah. So working on the frame. Now, I like to think that I'm a good welder. As a matter of fact, I, I know I'm a good welder, but that looks terrible. And part of that is because there is so much junk on the inside of the frame that the sandblaster just couldn't get to um, during the blasting process. And I cut the lip off. So starting there, all the way around. And of course, I'm gonna come back you know, smooth it all out, grind it all out, and then reinforce this whole front piece, reinforce all this bottom. But yeah, that's that's about the most nervous I've ever been in my life, cutting that front lip off, because you just don't know what to expect. And after all, it's just two pieces essentially tack welded together from the factory, because there's not much there. I mean, you could see the factory, well, so you probably can't see, but the factory loop on the rear side is literally tacked like there, 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 all the way around. That's all that's really holding it together. So yeah, full panic mode, but I think I got it together. Stop and have me a cold drink, get back at it, but whew. Make you uh, make you think twice about what you're doing. Got everything trimmed off. Still got to grind the front yet, but uh, the look's growing on me. Uh, definitely got these trimmed off. Got that nice and tight. Was able to uh, reweld the corners that got trimmed. So that's nice and uh, I better plate those. And then obviously uh, same deal on this side. Uh, added those. I don't think you guys saw those last time to reinforce the uh, upper bolt area for the control arm, the shafts. So, what's up, everybody? Another Sunday fun day back at it. Uh, starting off this video, we're going to talk about. Um, I'm going to go ahead and just get the speak on it topic out of the way for this video. I don't know how many of you guys watch till the end to, to hear those, but uh, this one's pretty important so I'm just gonna go ahead and get right to it if you're a business owner or a shop or someone who is a supplier for lowrider parts for the kind of stuff that we're doing just a word of advice don't be a douchebag don't be uh, the RJ tickler said it the best in one of his earliest videos if you're a triple OG thug from 20 years ago and you're too cool to just talk to somebody or give somebody some advice about something, just save it. It's not worth it. I mean, the world's too damn big for that. You know, it's 20 years ago. Yeah, you might have had to go and talk to somebody who knew somebody whose cousin's uncle put switches on a car, but it's different now. You know what I mean? Um, and with that being said, if a guy calls wanting advice on you know, hey, I'm trying to build this car. This is the part I need. Is this the correct part? Am I, you know, am I gonna waste my time and money and effort buying this part when I should be buying this part? Help a guy out. You know, do a guy solid because chances are, if you're good to that guy, he's gonna be good to you and he's gonna buy and order and spend his money with you. Um, so just don't be that guy, you know what I mean? And some of these young uh, guys that are and ladies who are getting into this sport, 
lifestyle, hobby, however you want to look at it, they don't know. They've never done this kind of stuff before. Um, so they're going off your advice. So if they call you and ask you a question, just be honest with them. Be upfront. Don't, you know, give them the, the cold shoulder because you feel like it's below you or you just don't have the time. That's, that shit's old. It's, it's annoying. Um, there's no place for it here. You know what I mean? Especially if we want your business to survive and thrive in the kind of, uh, you know, times that we're in now, because, you know, I'm, I'm not, I can't speak for everybody, but my money and my dollar is just as hard earned as anybody else's, whether I'm spending $20 or $2,000, it's all the same. So just do a guy solid and help him out. Okay. Pretty simple. Uh, with that being said, I'm at the dollar store Sunday morning. It's like 10 to nine. I got to get some more, um, poster board. I'm hoping to wrap up the the fabrication portion of the frame today like literally i think i've got maybe four pieces left to cut and tack weld to the frame and then i can start the welding so i'm out here sunday morning trying to get this board trying to get going i'm going to spend as much time as i can today on it and uh, do some welding here pretty soon so those of you that have stuck through this with me um, watched all the videos about the frame it's been a long journey with that but I appreciate you for sticking around. So I'm going to hop off here, get this poster board, get back at it. And uh, I'll see you guys on the flip side. All right, back at the house. Working on this thing. Got the poster board. You guys just saw that. Got her set up here. Going to be making a front cross member piece. Watching the uh, Cali swinging. Hopefully Jake and Jay can get some uh, DVD Blu-rays back out to us. But uh, man, I love love that show. I like having them in the garage. So yeah, just working on this and uh, gonna take this piece here and turn it into this. So yeah, I decided to keep the factory holes I like the look of that. I think it looks pretty cool. You know, come back in, weld, weld all this up here and uh, put a nice bead around it. So that's my plans for today. Finish off this part right here, get that belly portion in. Uh, still kind of undecided here. I think I'm gonna do both of those on both sides. Oop. And then of course, you know, plate this whole area here, but I mean, I'm I'm seeing the home stretch. I'm almost there. I mean, we're talking like, so we got one, two, three, and then the back side. So that would be, I'm talking like four pieces. I'm gonna keep this all open up here because of all the factory stuff. I'm not trying to do cage nuts and all that, which I love that look. I think it's really clean when guys do that. But I'm so undecided at this point about steering gearbox choices. Uh, sway bar stuff, um, core support, you know, all that stuff. I, I'm right now, this is kind of as far as I want to get. And then if I choose to come back in at a later, later date, once I figure out my steering gearbox situation, I can, I can come in and play it all that. So as of right now, I'm going to get that set up, get that cut out and, uh, start forming it, tacking it on. See you in a bit. All right. So use my templates. Made my plates, uh, got everything all cut out, ground down, pretty much ready to go. Got one there, got the other one right over there. Uh, switched to Lone Star Lowe's. You guys aren't hip to that channel, get on it, Lone Star Lowe's. Good people over there, good guys. So I'm switching, I'm gonna be switching my weld wire out to 0.025. I have been using uh, 3.5 for my tacks just because I wanted a, a bigger tack to get some of these uh, thicker areas and some of these plates where they joints line up and meet up and that sort of thing. But I like the 0.25 myself uh, for tight areas and I feel like I can control the arc more that way. Um, so... 
This is an 11 pound spool. And I'm gonna switch over to the 11 pound from these two pounders, just because from here on out, when I'm gonna be welding this frame, I'm going to uh, be using the 11 pounder and I wanna see how many of these it takes to weld this frame out. I mean, if it takes one, psh, that's awesome. If it takes two, well then, you know, I gotta get another one, but it's, you know, I don't know how much weld in terms of feet or length or any of that on here, but it's gonna be a lot. So gonna be switching over to this guy. I need to uh, weld up this belly cross member, um, may, mostly this front side. I wanna weld up this whole front side from about right there all the way around. Um, that way when I, I can you know smooth it out, then I can put this plate on top, grind it, and then weld both those plates together. Uh, with the chassis so that's where I'm at right now so I'm gonna get this thing set up look at that anyways get this thing set up get some tacking done and start doing some welding so hang tight so after going back and watching the video during the editing process I'm realizing that there might be some people out there that don't understand what it is that I'm doing here so I'm swapping the two pound spool for the 11 pound spool. Um, this is the first time I've ever done this on this machine for as long as I've owned it. But uh, looking back on it now, it was definitely, definitely worth it. So keep that in mind guys, if you're out there welding. And then again, this is probably the greatest example of, of having the rotisserie, not having to flip this frame around on the ground to do these kinds of projects. I mean, it's just been a big help to me. And uh, it being a waist height, it makes it easier to weld with as well. All right, well, there you have it. First welds, I'll be honest with you, makes me uh, pretty nervous. I mean, I've welded lots of things in my career as a welder, but when you're doing something like this, you know, and it's your own project, it's a little bit different. So you notice I welded, skipped, welded, skipped, welded, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, keeping, trying to keep the warpage down to a minimum. Just go tack to tack. Um, and then of course all this will be plated over and then I can come back and weld all of it together. Weld it all back together. So yeah, that's, pretty much the gist of it and that's going to be the process for the whole entire frame uh, eventually and uh, so yeah I just wanted to show you what that's like so I'm going to get some more done and bring you back here in a bit got a question for everybody ever working on your project doing a little bit of welding a little bit of fabricating everything's going real nice and then all of a sudden wham you're out of weld wire just like that, welding on this frame, and I've already gone through an entire 11 pound spool. That's spool number one. But I've been making a lot of progress. Hope to have everybody updated soon with another video. Everything's going really well. Making some killer passes on everything. Everything's flowing real nice. So stay tuned, have another video up soon. All right, ladies and gentlemen, it's the next day. Uh, you saw the little clip, ran out of wire. So made a trip after work today, picked up another new spool. So I am ready to go. Uh, just kind of touched on this previously. Everything's turning out really well. Uh, I like the way this is looking thus far. So gonna be doing some more welding today. And uh, I did grind down the spring. I know the sun's bright. Hopefully it's not affecting it. Grind down the spring pockets. Try to make those somewhat smooth. Get those shaped really nice. So I'm going to be doing some time lapsing. Setting you back up doing some welding. And uh, talk to you here in a bit. Alright, so I've had questions before about differences between, you know, somebody building a lay-in-place setup in a hopper 
If you're doing a lay and play, it may not be necessary to reinforce the ears like I'm doing, but at the end of the day, it's totally up to you as the builder, period. Do it as you see fit to your needs, and then it'll all work out in the end. All right, so after that time lapse, this is pretty much what I got done. Still a little smoky, as you can see, but uh, got her nice and uh, nice and burned in there. It's not the best, but I think I got plenty of uh, plenty of penetration where it counts. So. Not too exciting, guys. It's just welding. You know, you've seen me do it before. You've seen me do it in all the videos. But I'm just trying to get the frame done. So I'm going to keep on welding. And uh, when I move on to something else, I'll bring you back and we'll talk about that. Um, in the meantime, I hope you enjoy. See you in a bit. Hey, what's up, everybody? Back at it. Uh, trying to get this video knocked out. A lot of you have been asking for a video. And I been a little slow on getting those out but uh lots of uh things going on here lots of uh progress being made and um just it's we're in ohio it's winter uh we've already had snow multiple times and the nature of my job uh winter time is very very busy for me so i put in time when i can and try to work on these videos in this this car right here when i can but for right now i'm watching Cadillac Dan, shout out to him. Check out his channel. You can't you can't beat it. The guy's a hell of a welder. But uh, so let me get you flipped around and I'll show you what I've been working on. All right. So if you saw my last video, I was telling everybody about the frame and stuff uh, being to the point of where it's almost being done. That's my dog True. He's an old boy. He just likes to hang out. But anyways, um, so this is pretty much the point where I'm at now uh, that I'd say 99.5 percent of the frame is done uh, where I want it to be I know I kind of touched on that earlier and I talked about that a little bit in the last video um, by the time you guys see this video uh, this plate these in this will already be done so it you know probably be a couple days after now before I get this uploaded uh, but where I'm at today is I mainly just try to uh, check out how body bushings and stuff like that are going to fit these things got you know they got a little bit of play from the factory um so guys that ask me about you know how do you when you plate something how do you get it lined back up etc 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 just try to remember that these frames have a, a little bit of a tolerance that you know not everything has to be 100 percent dead nuts there is some movement to some things and uh the other question I got, which was a fantastic question, and I, forgive me, I can't remember who asked it, is how do you know what holes to cover, what holes to leave open, um, that sort of thing. So whether it's a X-Frame Impala car, uh, a G-Body, a Caddy, there are some things that just don't change. Uh, some are the body mounts, okay, that's, that's pretty important. Those gotta stay where they are because that's where the body bolt's on. Uh, control arm mounts that's pretty standard that those have to be now it doesn't have to be this exact setup like uh, Cadillac Dan has a video that he just did recently where he did uh, custom mounts on a big body frame which is awesome um, but that geometry that uh, of how everything bolts together here bolts together here that all needs to be a factory that needs to be consistent in its measurements uh, the other big thing, and I talked about this earlier in the video, is like uh, these bolt holes here, I'm sorry, I'm not paying attention. These bolt holes here for gearboxes, uh, steering, um, you'll have like a sway bar, sway bar mounts and stuff like that. Um, that stuff's, you know, pretty standard stuff. It has to be where it needs to be. Now, motor mounts, now that's a little bit different. Um, hang on, let me pause this here. 
Sorry about that. So like motor mounts is motor mounts is a little bit different. That's the exception to the rule, because if you're doing a conventional small block Chevy, you know this this stuff will bolt in just fine. You can plate over this. Um, the holes actually on my frame here. I actually uh, left this area open so I could access the bolt holes to get to those. Um, that way I could mark those and drill them out if I had to. Uh, if you're doing an LS in one of these cars, you'll typically get the motor mounts that will slide back and forth. Uh, Dirty Dingo is one of the companies that makes them. Uh, let's see, transmission cross member. If you have a stock uh, power glide going into these cars, that's pretty standard. If you're doing a 4L60 or 4L80E from an LS, um, you can use these mounts, but it actually comes back over and then back up. Uh, Lone Star Lowe's, uh, they got a pretty good tech thing on, on that. Um, obviously, coil springs, you know, you need to know where those are, as well as like lower rear control arm mounts go. If you're doing a three link, a four link, um, those will be welded in place already, unless you're planning on doing like a, larm, a long arm kit where these would have to be moved like somewhere up in here. Um, but that's that doesn't apply here. I just wanted to keep the stock wheelbase. Um, so I know that's kind of like a rough overview of of things like that. But if it if it if you need to keep it open because of the function of the car, okay, it has to have it, or you can't drive it forward, backwards, or turn left or right. Uh, you if you cover it over, you're gonna have to drill those holes out and uh, open those back up. A uh, great example of that would be like on the Impala, the uh, banana bar where it mounts there. This car isn't drilled on this side for one from the factory. So when I go to do my uh, bar, I'll have to transfer those holes over. Um, again, that's, I know that's a vague description, but once you start getting into it, you'll understand what I'm saying. Uh, there's a lot of okay this is a great thing this is a there's a lot of holes along this frame rail somewhere around in this area from the factory a lot of those are just locating pins from when this thing was manufactured on the assembly line uh, they don't mean anything to the car itself uh, other than you can take measurements for those uh, from one point say like a hole from like right here to up here and then from here all the way back to here you know those should be consistent it should be square but a lot of those holes are just locating pins from the factory when this thing was moving down the weld uh, assembly line for welding the jig so uh this is pretty much going to wrap up the frame for what i'm doing um like i said by the time you see this all these other plates will be done and again, I'm going to leave these open just because I'm undecided yet on the uh, steering situation. I did weld up the factory seam. Uh, the other big decision I have to make is, uh, do I wanna leave this like it is, or do I wanna grind and smooth all the welds completely? Um, I'll be honest with you, I've been going back and forth with myself about how I want to do this and I take pride in being a welder and I kind of like to show that stuff off at the same time this isn't perfect it's uh, a lot of late nights a lot of nights after work of just being dog tired and just wanting to get it done and some of the welds aren't aren't the prettiest welds so I could grind it all off smooth it out you know 99% of this frame you can't even see. Uh, Lone Star Lowe's talks about it. It's pretty much the body mounts forward that you see. And, you know, I'm not trying to hide anything. It is it is what it is. So I'm leaning towards leaving everything alone like it is and just being proud of it and happy of it and happy with it. And, uh, you know, somebody says, oh, wow, look at that weld. That looks pretty good. Whose weld is that? That was me. Or somebody comes up and goes, man, that weld looks like, you know what? Guess what? That was me. So I'm not I'm not too worried about it, to be honest with you. Uh, so I think I'm going to leave it alone and not smooth anything at this point. I'm not even close to painting this thing. 
Uh, I've gone against the idea of powder coat just because if I chip it, I can't touch it up at home. Um, I don't want water to get behind any kind of chips. So I'm leaning more towards a paint scenario so I can touch it up myself here at home um, or on the road if I need to, depending on whatever happens. So I think this is, I think this is it. So we could call that a wrap. Yeah, I tried to laugh. I tried to joke there. Sorry. Anyways, yeah, we can call this done. This is where I'm at. It's going to be a while before I get it painted. I uh, still want to do a full mock-up of the front suspension, uh, rear suspension, which brings me to my next point. My next project that I'm starting will be going to be doing the rear end cleanup, uh, fabrication for that. Yes, I know. It's a stock of Palo rear end. They're, they suck. They're crap. I've heard it all. RJ Tickler, he, he had a great video early in his video series about his Impala on those rear ends. Um, but I'm using it because it's the one I got. And do I have hopes and dreams to upgrade it someday to a, a beefier, like a pit bull or, you know, some kind of fabricated nine inch? Yep. But the money has to be there. And right now there's things I could buy that I feel like my money would be better spent on. Um, this thing, I'm this rear end, I'm just going to go through it, uh, take the third member apart, clean it, degrease it, uh, replace the bearings. Um, something, a common modification on these that really doesn't get talked about much, you think it would be talked about more, but it's really not, is uh, the bearings that go in the axle housings, you can actually tack weld, tack, not fully weld. Just tack those into the housing, and uh, that'll buy you some time and some security if you got to use um, a stopper in, which is what I'm going to do. Uh, two, the drum brakes for this rear end are incredibly cheap. I can do both sides for just a little over a hundred bucks. That's everything. So I'm going to go with the rear end that I got and, you know, maybe someday I'll come across a Versailles rear end or some kind of something that I can swap out. Um, but I do want to get started on control arms. I need to get moving on that. I need to get those spindles apart. Um, start test fitting the brake kit that I bought. And then I also want to start start making uh, remake these with the two by three box tube there. Um, I got all the parts for that. I got the bushings. I got the power balls. Um, obviously the box steel. So those are my goals coming up pretty soon. Um, hopefully I can start doing a video series on that. I know this frame one has been a long drawn out process, but. You know, it's it's not a full-time job for me. It's when I have time. And like I said, it's Ohio. And this time of year, um, it's incredibly tough to be out here as much as I want to be. Plus, you know, there's holidays, family time, that sort of thing. Uh, so now let's go over some um, pretty important things. Some questions that I was asked through the channel uh, that I tried to discuss in the last video. But... I'll get a little bit more in depth, so hang tight. I'm gonna get you set up and uh, we'll go over those things. All right, so some of the questions I've been getting um, are pretty similar and uh, the context of what they wanna know and mostly that's like the cost, you know, how much did it cost to do this? How much did it cost to do this? Should I attempt to do this on my own? Um, you know, those kinds of questions. So. Everything that I'm about to write here, none of it is the gospel. It's just me and you talking. I'm not speaking for another shop. I'm not speaking for another car builder. I'm not speaking for um, the steel guy that sells you the steel or the gas guy that sells you the welding gas. It's just me talking, okay? So prices are going to vary, so keep that in mind. Uh, but let's get the, the big elephant out of the room, the cost. So... How much did it really cost me to do this frame? All right, so without having a core, okay, I had my own frame. If you wanted to buy a core, they're 800 to 1,000 bucks. So I got lucky that I had my frame. Now, uh, some people say that you can do this with two, I believe it's four by 10 plates of uh, steel, sheet three, uh, steel 3 16 um, My scenario, my situation was a little bit different. My local steel yard 
uh, I'm really fortunate that they have what's called recycled steel, which is basically like they sell drops. So if I bought a 20 foot piece and I only need a 10 foot of it, they would resell the other 10 at a discounted rate. And for me, being local here where I live, that discounted rate was actually 70 cents a pound. So it's a huge savings. So I would buy uh, four by four uh, pieces of sheet steel and um, to buy all, I actually went through three of those. That's total of the frame. That's every plate that I've put on this frame that you've seen in this entire video series. Uh, so each one of those was 100 bucks times three. So uh, I'm 300 bucks. That's just in steel. Now, yes, I know that sounds like incredibly cheap or to some people that might be really expensive. Uh, for me, it's, that's, hang on a second. All right, I'm back, sorry about that. So yeah, 300 bucks, that's what I spent on just steel, okay? Um, like I said, I got that at a discounted rate, it was 70 cents a pound. Um, so my grand total for just steel at this point was 300 bucks. That's no control arms, that's no rear end, that's just the frame. So keep that in mind. The next thing, uh, weld gas. So I have a bottle that's considered like an 80 pound MIG bottle. I've had it forever. I wish it was the bigger bottle, but it's, it's, the, it's the smaller one. That's the one I bought when I got out of welding school almost 20 years ago, and I've had it ever since. So uh, this applies to 80 pound, uh, or uh, size 80 bottles, which are about, I don't know, about waist high. Um, on this entire frame, I went through three of those, and uh, they were 50 bucks to fill them. So, uh, 50 bucks uh, times three of those, so 150 bucks. So that's just welding gas, okay? Um, could you do it any cheaper? Honestly, I don't know. Uh, I don't, you know, it all depends on where you live price of gas at the time because this stuff's going up and down all the time um you know if you have a bigger bottle that's say like the 120 which is uh what 40 cubic feet more of gas you can make it last a little bit longer um but for me i averaged three bottles um in well of gas so between just the metal just the gas um i'm 450 it's 450 bucks to do this frame. The next thing, weld wire. Um, when I did all the tacking, I started out with just the little two pound spools and those things are like 14 bucks. So let's say I used one of those uh, at 14 bucks. So I'm $14 into the tack one and then I switched over to the 11 pound spools. Um, those are roughly about 30 bucks and I'm almost two full spools of 11 pounds in this frame uh, so 30 bucks times two uh, 60 bucks yeah so I'm 60 bucks and just weld wire and that uh that actually surprises me I didn't think that I would go through uh, two 11 pound spools, but you know, that's what it takes. So keep that in mind for you DIY guys at home who are thinking, Hey, I want to try this. You know, low riding is not cheap. Relatively speaking. Yeah. I'm $525, I think so far, that's everything to do this frame. But the biggest cost is my labor, right? I'm not charging I'm not charging myself, obviously, to do this frame. It's when I work on it, that's when I get the time. Um, so my labor's free to me. But if I was gonna have a shop do this, and even, you know, a shop that only charged, say, 50 bucks an hour, I don't know exactly how many hours I have in this frame because I didn't wanna keep track of none of that because I enjoy this kind of stuff and I don't want to uh, have a sticker shock of knowing, you know, my time and what it took me to do this, but I'm enjoying every minute of it, so I didn't, I didn't take note of any um, any of my time on this, but at 50 bucks an hour, let's say I've got 
um, you know, 50 hours in it. Well, you do the math. It's not cheap. So there is a, an advantage to doing this on your own. If you have uh, the things like I talked about in my last video, if you have a shop or a workspace, if you have the welder, um, if you, that's the other thing, you know, the hypotheticals of this, if I'm, if I had to start over and do this all from scratch, I need a welder. Even a good used welder is going to be 500 bucks. Okay. I don't care what you say. It's going to be 500 bucks for a decent one. And that's a 110 or if you're lucky, you'll find a 220. Uh, I used a plasma. Okay. I've said it time and time and time again, that thing was worth every stinking penny. Uh, so I'm 300 bucks. Yeah, that's a three. Sorry. I'm 300 bucks into the plasma. Do you have to have that? No, you can do this with a, a grinding wheel or cutoff wheels. Okay. But that's a whole nother problem and another cost thing. I started out initially with a hundred cutoff wheels and I went through a hundred cutoff wheels like that just on the rear frame rails before I even got to the uh, rear control arm mounts. I went through a hundred cutoff wheels because cutting through 316's plate, let's be honest, it's not easy. Those hundred cutoff wheels, uh, cut wheels, uh, let's see, that was 50 bucks. I had 50 bucks in just cutoff wheels. Now, having this cut down on this drastically, Okay, because I haven't used a single cutoff wheel since I bought that plasma. And that's no lie, that's the truth. Because it cuts so fine and precise. Um, to, I, I just, I haven't had a need to pick up a cutoff wheel. Now grinding wheels, that's a whole different story. Uh, flap wheels, or the hard stone wheels, let's just talk about the flap wheels. Um, when you're using a plasma, it leaves a, an edge on it that's very similar to like a stick welding where you have like a slag that you need to either chip off or grind away. And if your hand's not really steady, you can get little teeny tiny little grooves. And you typically want to uh, grind those out. So I did go through flap disc quite a bit. Uh, Amazon, another place for those. Uh, Lone Star Lowe's actually turned me on to those. I see I bought 50... 50 flat discs for, I think, 25 bucks. So, uh, flat disc, so I'm 25 bucks in the flat disc, okay? Which is, relatively speaking, that's really cheap. You can go to Harbor Freight, you can buy like a pack of three for 10 bucks or something like that. Um, just jump on Amazon, just, you know, buy a stack of them. You're gonna need them, you're gonna go through them. If I was going to smooth this frame, I would probably need another 50, maybe even a hundred. You know, I don't know. It just depends on how crazy you want to get. The sky's the limit. And you know, in terms of like cost, the sky's the limit. So again, DIY guys, those of you that have reached out and asked me, Hey, I want to try this. I want to do this at home. You know, what's well, a good starting point. You got to have this. Obviously this is an option. These two, you can't live without, you got to have them. So, that's my initial cost um, thus far to do this frame. So we got what 450, let's call that 525. Um, let's see, uh, 825. So let's let's call it a thousand bucks. We're gonna say a thousand bucks. That's what I have, and doing this my own on my own. So. Uh, it's not that I don't want to pay a shop. It's not that I don't have the money to pay a shop. It, this is my dream car build. And for me to be able to do this on my own for a thousand bucks, I, I just, I couldn't beat it. You know what I mean? And I, I take pride in saying that this, those are my welds. Um, I cut every single plate, piece of plate still in there, good or bad. Um, I did have to re have to redo a few of them. So that happens. Um, but at the end of the day, I did it. And if I was in a scenario where I didn't have a shop or a garage or didn't have all these fancy tools and I could afford to pay somebody, go for it. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, if I could have found a pit bull frame that I could have afforded, you know, really afforded, because let's be honest, 
Pitbull doesn't do a whole lot of frames anymore. They will do a frame for you, but their business has kind of changed a little bit. And I understand why, you know, that's, it is what it is. But I, if I could have found a Pitbull frame, I would have bought it because those things are badass. Um, you know, did, did, is what I did just as good as a Pibble frame? In my eyes, it is. You know, it may not be uh, perfectly stacked dimes and look like it's diamond cut, but at the end of the day, I know it's strong. I did, you know, the best of my ability, and I'm pretty happy with it. I'm pretty proud of it. So, yeah, for a thousand bucks, you know, you can't beat it. Um, so, to those people that reached out to me, don't be afraid to try it. You know, make, make these initial uh, purchases if you can just to get started uh, go to your local steel yards talk to the steel uh, foremans there and say hey you know this is what I'm doing I'm, I need 3 16th plate or quarter or even if you wanted to go eighth inch that's the other thing that's kind of like I don't want to say taboo in the low rider world but I guess in a way it really is you can buy eighth inch plate kits and a lot of guys will buy those, not so much for the reinforcement, but for um, the show side of it to make it look, you know, nice and smooth, make it look prettier. Um, so when everybody's looking underneath it, you know, it's got that look, and that's awesome. That's cool. Um, I did the three sixteenths because I wanted the insurance because I plan on three wheeling this car, and you know. A lot of things happen with these cars. Inherently, these frames are, are somewhat weak because of the design, but you know, this is nothing new. It's, it's, we, we've known about this forever. Um, and the other thing is, you know, I'm, I would like to put a hot setup in this car. I'm not sold on how many batteries and pumps just yet, but if this thing taps the bumper, it taps the bumper. I know it's gonna be safe. I know it's gonna be strong. Um, it's gonna be done right. So that's, that's pretty much where I'm at with the whole thing. Um, the other big thing I wanted to talk about was like weight. So I get asked this question uh, a little bit on my social media stuff. So we'll go ahead and I'll, I'll make a, sorry, we'll just stick with this one. I forgot I had stuff on there. Uh, we'll just stick with this one. So the stock frame, um, I don't know really what that way to be honest with you. I took it earlier in my earlier videos to get it sandblasted and me and a buddy was able to move it. So we're talking 250 pounds maybe, 300 pounds. I really don't know. It was a lot lighter than I thought it would be. I was shocked. And um, so to do what I've done with 3 16 um, you're looking at roughly about Eight hundred pounds. That's the steel. That's the frame. Uh, uh, roughly about eight hundred pounds. And yes, it adds a lot of weight to the frame. But I can tell you, just from rolling this thing in and out of the garage when I first started, that thing would, you know, it, it had some wiggle to it. It is strong as can be now, and it's solid. And yeah, it's it's heavy. But also, you got to figure. I'm just about two 11 pound spools of wire. So that's right there, that's that's 22 pounds of just weld wire. So, you know, figure in, if I was, of course, if I ground it down, it would take some of that weight off. Um, but at this point, I'm, I'm gonna live with it like it is. Um, but yeah, so you're 822 pounds. At this point that's what I, that's my best guess i'm again this isn't the gospel um this is just me thinking about it and uh coming to the conclusion that that's where i'm at so uh I'm trying to think if there's any other costs associated with it oh obviously electricity but who's keeping score of that i'm not because i don't want to know um what else did i buy uh Oh, I was incredibly fortunate to have C-clamps. Um, so if you're gonna do this at home, guys, get you some C-clamps. Uh, get, you, get you some of these right here. This thing, it, it took a beating. Um, and I, I had probably four of these to use during this whole entire process that you guys have seen throughout these videos. Um, now you can make a hydraulic clamp 
uh, let's see, Lone Star Lowe's has one. Um, Cadillac Dan's made one. Uh, let's see. I'm sure there's some other guys out there that have done it too that I'm just not thinking about, but you can do that as well. Um, keep in mind as you weld, you know, do a little bit here, a little bit here, that plate will get warm and hot and then it will become pliable and flexible. So the clamps, you, you can actually move stuff quite a bit with just C clamps. Um, what else did I have to buy? Oh, the engine stand rotisserie. Do you have to have that? Nope. RJ Tickler did a frame in his early videos uh, where he didn't have a rotisserie. He just did it right there on the garage floor and it, you know, it worked fine for him. Yeah, it's a pain in the ass to have to flip it over eventually because it weighs at that point, you know, 400, 500 pounds, but it can be done. Um, I made that whole entire thing for less than a hundred bucks. So yes, it's, you, you can do that. Um, I'll never ever do this again without one. I can tell you that. Um, I'm so thankful that I made it looking back on it now. Um, so if I ever do another one of these frames, which I might, I don't know. Um, I thought about it, you know, making another one and helping using that to fund the build of my car, which is a cool concept. It's a cool idea. But at the end of the day, man, I, I be honest with you guys, I really don't know if I have the time um, because it took everything I had to just to do this one. So I don't know. I'll cross that bridge when I get there. Um, we'll see. But other than that, I can't really think of any other any other major costs. Um, so I ha I hope that answers a lot of your questions concerning what does this cost, you know. And these numbers are just kind of like a, a broad overview. It's I'm not nickel, you know, down to the nickel and dime and penny here on what I spent. So I hope this gives everybody some idea. And uh, to those of you who are asking, hopefully this is encouraging news. You can do it. Right there's your cost. You know, just be smart about it. Um, only spend money where you have to. You know what I mean? So I think that's going to cover that part of it. Okay. So let's. Uh, something occurred to me when I uh, turned the video off is. You got guys at home who've, who've never uh, welded or, or have welded, but don't have enough experience to say tackle an entire project like this. They don't know where to start. Um, so I just got a quick overview of what that takes. Um, so if you don't want to watch this part, feel free to skip ahead. Uh, this is nothing different than I offer in my welding classes. So I don't mind to share. It's no big deal. So this has been up here for quite a while. Uh, I, hopefully it's turning out good because a lot of it's worn off, but these are the basics. Guys at home who are wanting to start welding, if you're going to do this on your own, these basic steps won't do you wrong, okay? First one, we're doing MIG welding. So we're using a solid core wire, okay? Uh, can you do this with flux core? Yes. Do I recommend it? No. Uh, the cleanup, the cost isn't really... Yeah, you have to buy welding gas, but by the time you make that initial investment, your time not having to chip slag and clean welds will be worth its weight in gold compared to buying the gas bottle. So don't be cheap, just buy the gas bottle. So solid core wire, you're doing a 75-25 shielding gas mix. Uh, you can do an 80-20. It just depends on what your local company offers, but typically this is what everyone gets. Consumables. Uh, this, I know this is wore off, but it's, I started out with 0 0.25, uh, point, uh, 0 0.25 wire, okay? Solid core wire. That was the little two pound spools I was talking about. Uh, to do the actual welding part, um, I did the heavy tacks with a 35 thousandths, and then I switched back to the 25 for the weld out. Um, I know that's going to be different with everybody. Uh, if you look at, you know, I, I don't want to speak for any certain company, but like, let's just say an example of a pit bull frame. I mean, he's stacking quarters, not dimes. So he's got a pretty big MIG wire, you know, to the, from what I understand and from what I've seen, and which is great. Um, my MIG machine, my unit here, I'm pretty much tapped out at 35. So yeah, that's pretty much, you know, the max for what I'm doing. Uh, 75, 25 shielding gas, which we already talked about. Uh, you got your contact tip your nozzle, and then of course your PPE, okay? These things are, you know, these are consumables. You're gonna have to replace these, PPE. 
safety glasses, welding jacket, helmet. Guys, get that stuff. Don't hurt yourselves. Don't be stupid. Get stuff, protect yourself, okay? You'll thank me later, I promise you. Uh, optional things, nozzle spray or nozzle dip. Uh, when you're doing MIG welding, you get a lot of slag buildup on the inside of the nozzle. You gotta constantly stop and take your pliers and clean that stuff out. If you get this stuff here, it cuts down on that uh, drastically, you know, so you're not always trying to spend time cleaning out the nozzle. Uh, MIG machine basics, again, not the gospel. This is just an overview to help a guy get started. Uh, gas flow rate needs to be between 15 and 20, okay? When you look at your little gauge, not the pounds, the other gauge that's got the smaller numbers, when you hit that trigger and it releases gas, make sure that it stays between 15 and 20. Don't go any less, don't go any higher, okay? Uh, wire speed and voltage will depend on the thickness of your base metal. There is no like, you set it to 10 and you know, A on the machine. It's not really like that. You're gonna have to play with your settings. Uh, a good ground helps, a uh, clean contact tip, a newer contact tip helps because over time a contact tip can wear out and that will cause the wire to drag and it'll mess up all kinds of things. Um, but it, a lot of it depends on your base thickness of your base metal, you know, how fast you're moving, um, that sort of thing. And I'll, I'll address that here in a little bit. Uh, a good general rule of thumb, and, that, and this would apply probably two, three sixteenths. Any metal with a thickness over a quarter inch requires multiple weld passes to be structural, okay? That's the way I was taught. I went to school at Hobart, which is world renowned. Um, that's a really good guideline to live by, okay? Especially like doing the three sixteenths on these frames. On a .25 wire, you can fit multiple passes if you really wanted to, or you can stretch it out. That comes with time, that comes with skill level. Um, so, you know, guys, you know, play around with that, uh, try that out, and see what, uh, see what you can do. On your base metal prep, there's a lot of different types of weld joints. I'm gonna keep it simple, okay? Butt joints, lat joints, open root joints, and a plug weld or what's called a rosette weld, okay? Again, real simple, butt joint. Two pieces of metal that go together. They butt together, okay? You can have, I'll bring this a little closer. You can have two joints that come together like this, but you only get reinforcement on the top and the bottom. If you do a bevel, a V, okay? You can get weld all in that complete weld joint, okay? Lap joints, okay, pretty self-explanatory. Um, an open root joint, which is, is two pieces of metal that have a gap between the two, okay? So you can get your root, your middle, and your cover, your fill and your cover all at one time, okay? Um, the last one would be plug welds or rosette welds. Okay, where this comes in handy are, it, or will be like if you have holes that you need to fill. I need to fill a hole in my frame. Um, I need to fill a hole in a control arm or uh, whatever the scenario is. If it's open on the back side, okay, you can plug weld that or rosette weld. Uh, you can also, this is an option, copper, okay? Copper can go on the back side of an open hole and you can weld right over top of the copper and fill that entire hole and it, this backing plate will not stick. Okay, because you have a ferrous and non-ferrous metals together. So you can weld over this copper and then pull it away and it will be perfectly smooth. Okay, so keep that in mind. You don't have to have, this was a part of a bus bar from a, a machine from a power plant from years ago that I used to work at, but you can use copper pipe uh, like in your house. If you have a piece that's just a scrap piece that you can cut and flatten out, it'll work the same. So keep that in mind, rosette welds and uh, plug welds. You can back up with copper, okay? Uh, let's see. These are, these are just some basics on getting started, okay? Again, not the gospel. I just wanna help a guy out the best I can. If you're gonna be doing this at home, I'm trying to give you the best chance of being successful from the start. It's gonna take time, it's gonna take practice. You're gonna to have to mess up, you're gonna to have to start over, but 
This is the basics, okay? Uh, your, I, in my case, I'm uh, 120 volt, 100% uh, direct current electronegative. So that's for a solid core wire. If you had to go direct current electropositive, that would be um, your um, flux core. But we're not doing that here, okay? So that's a lot of information at one time. It's not that big of a deal. Just set your MIG welder up for solid core wire, okay? Uh, obviously gas, 7525, metal, you know, you've got various thicknesses. The, the frame on this car, uh, I don't know if it's eighth inch. I'm not really sure, to be honest with you. Um, but, you know, we got 316th plated over it, so that's fairly thick. Um, this is the thing that I want. If anybody takes anything away from all of this today, it's right here, okay? I see this more common than I've ever seen it before with people who are just starting out welding. Work angle versus travel angle, okay? If you're coming into a weld joint, this is my weld joint right here, you wanna be at a 45 degree angle if you can help it, okay? Because it will get equal amount of weld on both plates and uh, you're not favoring one versus the other, which is applying more heat to the you know to this plate versus this plate. Um, this this trips guys up a lot, and then travel angle too, because if you have if you're if you're at a 45, which is ideal, okay. If you increase that drag angle, your shielding gas may not hit the weld like it's supposed to fully, and that can create all sorts of problems. Two, the stick out of the wire, you know, increases as that travel angle increases because it's having to reach out to the workpiece further, okay? And there's a whole host of problems with that. Um, so the thing that I was always taught like at school or in the industry that I'm in, if you're welding, it should sound like frying bacon, okay? And that's that's no gag or joke, that's, that's, that's true. It should sound like frying bacon, there's something frying in a pan. When you hear that, you'll know it's running nice. It's everything looks good. This also will cause porosity. Porosity is any kind of defect in the, into the surface of the weld or into the weld joint itself. If it's too much of a travel angle, you know it should be 45 and 45. If you're too much, it'll blow the shielding gas away or not even cover the piece that you're welding, and then you'll have porosity and you'll have all kinds of problems. Okay, so what shielding gas is doing is it's actually creating an atmosphere around the weld. All right, so oxygen cannot get in. Okay, that's important. Um, if you have your shielding gas flow rate turned up too high, you can actually blow the shielding gas away from the weld. It does happen, I've seen it. Um, and obviously if the shielding gas is too low, then you'll have incomplete coverage around here. Welding techniques, this comes with time, okay? And I, I, there's something I wanna to touch on, I'll get back to that, but the, th the thing that I try to teach guys, if you want that dime look, that if dime effect, you can do what's called a cursive E, okay? And it's really simple. If I'm starting out off my, ta say this is my tack weld, I'm, and I'm right-handed, I'm gonna progress to the right on my weld bead, okay? So I'm going to essentially just write a cursive E, or sometimes it's known as whip and pause. I'm going to whip, pause, whip, pause whip pause it's just that simple okay but where it takes the skill is your speed maintaining the 45 and the 45 that's important um, you can do what they call a crescent moon um, that's really common it's really common stick welding uh, this is a little bit more advanced i would not recommend this for a first timer so forget that dissimilar metals okay this is a big one, safety-wise, okay? You gotta be careful here. Um, you can weld steel, carbon steel, and stainless steel together, okay? Because stainless steel is steel with other elements like nickel and chrome and some other things in it. Now, where this will trip somebody up is if I have something that's perfectly polished stainless, okay, like let's say a muffler, a, a MagnaFlow muffler, and I want to weld a bracket to it so I can hold it to my frame at like an exhaust hanger. You wouldn't want to weld just carbon steel to that stainless steel muffler because that will rust in time. That joint will rust. You'll have a hole. It'll be worthless. 
if you have a piece of steel that you don't care about, you're like, I just want to finish the job. I've got this piece of stainless here. I really don't care about it. You can actually weld that to the steel and it not be an issue. So the thing that you want to be careful with, uh, and how you doing? I talked to you before. You don't think you're making progress. I am. I'm, I'm almost there. Keep it up. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Sorry. It's one of my neighbors. Uh, so anyways, you can weld steel to stainless. You can weld stainless to steel. It just depends on what you're trying to do and the look you're going for, okay? Uh, so if it's a piece of carbon steel and you don't care about it, you can weld stainless to it. If it's the other way around, don't do it. Uh, as far as the safety aspect of the dissimilar metals, this is very, very important. Stay away from galvanized and ductile iron, okay? galvanized, fence posts, um, some exhaust, some, uh, I don't even know, galvanized is in all kinds of things. Uh, if it's got a gray chalky coating to it, don't weld it, okay? Um, if you're welding it, let's say you don't know what it is or what the metal is you're welding, you, you know it's some kind of steel, but you're welding it anyways. If you start to experience a flu-like symptom, like lightheadedness, a headache, uh, you, you know, you might get sick. Stop. It's poisonous. Galvanized steel is poison when you're welding it because it off gases. And that usually by the time you feel those symptoms, it, it can be too late. Um, so if you get to where you're welding that stuff and you're feeling sick, call 911. Have a loved one call help, okay? Um, ductile iron. Ductile iron is not very common in what we're doing. Uh, but the only reason I say that is because, you know, if you got a welder, you're gonna make friends, okay? Because that just happens. People want stuff done and they'll get a hold of you and they say, hey, I need this fixed. Ductile iron is typically found like, let's say in front end loaders, like on the boom of a backhoe. Uh, ductile iron is not recommended to, to weld because for one, it requires uh, like an x-ray or a dye penetrant test. Um, the other thing is that ductile iron is very porous and it can have surface cracks or cracks below the surface that you can't see with the negative eye. Um, so you may weld something for somebody, you send it out in the field, next thing you know, it breaks and kills a guy. You don't want that on your conscience. You don't wanna to have to do that. So stay away from that crap, okay? It's not worth it. Uh, tell your buddy or your neighbor or, or Jimbo up the street, hey, you need to call you know, a licensed professional welder or a weld fab shop and get advice from them. Um, so galvanized ductile iron, stay away from it guys. Now to say ductile iron does not mean like, uh, like a cast iron. If you want to stick weld an engine block or let's say a header manifold, go for it. You know what I mean? It's very hard. Um, it's not for the first timer. It takes a lot of practice, um, but you can do it. Um, there's other things that go with that, like preheating and postheating, which is a whole other ball of wax that you don't have to worry about doing the lowrider thing, okay? So don't be afraid to uh, tackle your frame and, and think that you have to worry about that kind of stuff. Last thing, make it super quick. If you have a weld joint that is a, a perfect 90, okay, or it could be um, it could be a 45, it could really be anything that you have to put multiple passes into. And by multiple pass, that's your weld joint right there. This is what's known as the root. This is your first pass, okay? To do multiple passes, do 50% coverage of every pass, okay? That way you get plenty of reinforcement on all your previous passes, all right? Step that all the way up. Kind of showed it here with another uh, student I had previously, but um, you know, try to try to do 50% coverage over every single pass. Okay, that way uh, everything's covered, and you're not having to come back with a grinder, or you're not having to come back and refill everything, and that sort of thing. So, this is just a really broad overview of getting started with the welding. I hope somebody who watches these videos can take something from it. Um, please feel free to ask questions in the comments, you know, Hey, how do I do this? How do I do this? I'll answer it to the best of my ability. Um, again, 
not the gospel, just a guideline, okay? Um, so I hope this has been helpful. So I'm going to close this down and we'll, uh, we'll probably end this video out. All right, everybody. So yes, it's been a long video. This has been a long uh, build series. Everyone that's stuck through with me till the end, um, I really can't thank you enough. And the Lowrider uh, family as a whole has been really supportive. And uh, there's a couple people that I would like to personally thank. Uh, my brother-in-law, Tony. I would like to thank him for being a supporter of the channel. My brother, Matt, out in the, uh, near Baltimore. Uh, thank you for watching, brother. I appreciate it. Um, you know, Lone Star Lowe's, uh, Cadillac Dan, um, Alex from Hoppo's. I mean, the list goes on and on. So I really appreciate the support and uh, the guys that have let me ask a zillion questions about how to do this kind of stuff. Uh, so the next thing, like I said earlier, we'll be moving on to the rear end, the control arms. Uh, getting the, I'm doing a one inch extension on my uppers and then of course my lowers all fully plate and reinforce uh, I'm planning on running a three and a quarter maybe three and three quarter ton coil I'm not sure yet but I'll probably have to enlarge the spring pocket for that uh, let's see oh I'll have to fabricate the rear lowers so that's coming so stay tuned for that if you're curious about that um, and yeah I'm just gonna keep trucking along the videos may become a little, a little, uh, sorry for the sun there, might be a little bit of, you know, time between them just because it's winter time here in Ohio. Um, I'm always busy plowing or doing welding or whatever they got me doing. That's what I'm out doing. So, uh, I want to get through the suspension stuff and then plans are to start on this. Uh, I got to do a partial floor pan. Uh, the front toe wells on this car, they're shot and the partial trunk pan, like the lower pan section, uh, the center of the trunk, everybody's seen those. They're notorious for rotting out. So I gotta do that. That's gonna be, that's gonna be a big one. But at this point, I'm still on target for that guy right there to be a full roller by spring. That's, uh, that's motor, trans, paint, uh, cylinders I got that's the other thing I got to drill holes for the cylinders there's a million videos out there on how to do that if you want to see me do that process comment below I'll, I'll be sure and include it on a future video um, so yeah I got to do that still uh, let's see paint it yeah I already said that paint it uh, I got to install the disc brake kit make sure all that this I want this to be a full roller before it goes to paint that way I know everything bolts up nice everything lines up correctly if I have to go back and, excuse me, if I have to go back and change stuff, I'll be able to do it at that point. So yeah, I'm still on track for spring. That's my goal. And I think it's a realistic goal that I can achieve. It just, it's gonna take some time. Um, so again, everybody that's stuck in there with me, thank you very much. I appreciate it a lot. And uh, I look forward to doing more videos. So feel free to like, share, and comment. Please subscribe. Um, and let everybody know what we're doing here and let me know what you want to see. If there's something specifically you want to see, I'll do my best to include it in the videos. So again, take care. I appreciate it. And we'll see you later. Peace. Quick shout out to uh, Max over at the Chop, uh, Defiance Ohio, uh, Switches by Jay, and Ryan Worrell. Without you guys, I wouldn't be where I'm at today. So thank you so much for all the help and support.